Uh, hi everyone, so this is um, Axeli down here and I'm a student in Tübingen and this semester I'm taking a birdsong seminar by Lena Weidt. Um, and in this seminar on Monday I presented this paper by uh, Jack Goffinet et al. Um, where they basically compared the vocal repertoires of mouse and birdsong and they use these variational autoencoders uh, and UMAP to create uh, these latent spaces. And the seminar is really about birdsong and I understand it better. Here really focusing on the auditory aspects. In the um, seminar we also talk a lot about the neurosciences of it, but that's not the focus of this paper. But um, when I gave this presentation, I actually focused a lot on variational encoders and uh, even more on UMAP. Um, and quite a few people also working with these methods found it quite useful because they um, struggled to understand them. So I thought um, if you're interested in understanding variational autoencoders in UMAP, this might actually be a good video, not necessarily because you care about birdsong. I mean, it's really interesting. I love birdsong, but um, I think birdsong will be a good example to explain how these two work. And I'll first talk quite a lot about the theory of these two and I'll make it very visual so that people who struggle with maths can get a visual understanding, but I'll also go a bit into the maths of it. And um, when I, um, uh, after the presentation, I get into this little rabbit hole about how uh, the loss function that is described theoretically in the UMAP paper might actually not actually be the reason why UMAP is so effective and there's another um, it, it's quote unquote true loss function might depend on other reasons. So I'm going to give you some intuition on why you work works so well. And um, yeah, but um, let's start actually with the people who did this paper. So um, uh, Jack and Samuel were um, students in the labs of Richard and John um, at the time in 2021 when the paper was written. And Richard Moon is really well known in the birdsong community, done lots of work. And what I found interesting is that John Pearson actually has quite an, although this is an um, auditory data only paper, he does a lot of interdisciplinary work. So I think it's really cool how to see how um, these machine learning methods are combined with neural and behavioral data. So um, it, uh, as input to this variational autoencoders, we had these vocalizations. Um, quite a few of them from these cute little zebra finches and zebra finches tend to um, do two types of song directed song where they directed at a female um, for mating reasons and undirected song is when they are on their own and they just kind of play around with it and I'm just going to play those two Okay, that was directed song, and here's undirected song. Uh, and uh, as you might have noticed, they sound quite similar. Um, so I think um, it'll be interesting to explore since we can, or I at least, I can really hear a difference about these two, whether a variation or decoder can understand these differences better. Uh, other input data to the variation or decoder was these. Uh, mouse ultrasonic vocalizations by this cute little mouse here and if you listen to them normally well um because it's ultrasonic you can't hear it uh, our ears are not in the range of these vocalizations but if i slow it down uh, you can hear it and you can kind of hear that it's a bit like sounds a bit like a screaming and has these continuous longer uh, calls by the way this is a spectrogram where Time is on the um, x-axis and frequency is on the y-axis and the color represents the amplitude at each point. Um, you can see it's really in a high frequency range here. I've highlighted this here and this is a lot of data. So a lot of people have recorded these uh, vocalizations. All right, so um, why did these authors even decide to uh, use these variational encoders with this input data? So part of the idea is that when you're trying to quantify something like mouse and birdsong and maybe uh, carrot experiments, 
it, it's hard because we listen to the recordings and it's hard to kind of capture like what is it about these that are different and what uh, features can we measure and often traditionally when this is done um, you would pick some acoustic features by hand you might categorize different syllables that are specific to a zebra fringe song or something like that or you might look at something like the frequency band or entropy or these quantitative measures of the song but the problem is that they're often uh, biased to our human perceptual biases or our human umwelt as some people might say and i like this quote by wittgenstein here uh, if a lion could speak we wouldn't understand it which is kind of the point that um lion sensory and ecological world is so different to us that when we listen to the calls from a different species we might not even know um, what would be relevant to them and what wouldn't be and therefore i think it's kind of cool to use these unsupervised machine learning methods um, and also uh, handbag acoustic features could be correlated just because of how they are constructed so if we want to do statistical testing where independence is important that can get tricky also we get these interesting questions like how do you even define boundary of a syllable or vocalization unit like here you could say it um, here you could say here and here we draw the boundary or is this is this the boundary uh, it's tricky to define right uh, um, so this is an autoencoder and in this paper as inputs they had these uh, spectrograms um, to the autoencoder and um, each of these spectrograms was segmented in such a way that you kind of have a, a single syllable in the middle like this and uh, around there it's segmented so it's a, a single syllable um, and here uh, we have important definitions called samples and features each of these would be a sample uh, so three samples and um, each of these samples single syllables has a features which are the little bins in the spectrogram so each um, spectrogram has uh, 128 squared uh, pixels 128 pixels here this way uh, and then each of these little pixels uh, has um, a value of zero to one. So the blue stuff here would be a zero and the very brightest yellow part here would be a one. So the input dimensionality um, of this input is 128, uh, 128, 128. And um, basically what this autoencoder is trying to do is pass this information into this encoder, into this bottleneck, into this decoder, and then reconstruct the input that was passed into it with the same dimensionality um, as here. And this is the dimensionality of the observation space, which I designated as RD. Um, and the key thing about this structure is that it has this sand clock-like structure where uh, compression is done here because when it is passed into this bottleneck, the dimensionality of this input data is reduced, um, which creates this compression because basically this model, in order to reconstruct these things, has to kind of compress what's important about these spectrograms uh, and only using that those important, sometimes called uh, latent features, it has to then recreate input. So somehow the compression uh, is supposed to help the model learn what's important. Um, and um, yes, there are also, uh, what I said about the learning, I kind of written down here formally. So the input is this x, and x uh, dash is the, the reconstructed output. And you basically want to minimize the difference um, of this and that. And that's shown here. And I also mentioned something about CNN features, basically because if you're familiar with convolutional neural networks, which have images as uh, input data, uh, they have some convolution elements. So these would be here and here. Uh, which helps you to process images and i think it's kind of ironic that actually we're working with auditory data the bird and mouse song i played to you earlier but really what we're feeding into the network is visual data so i think that's quite uh, ironic yeah so um to explain variational autoencoders i thought we would go to my note taking app so i could explain this a bit more detail but um we talked about autoencoders before which is this here and variational autoencoders are basically a probabilistic version of that that rely on ideas from variational inference and generally Bayesian statistics. So as before, um, we got an input, we're passing it through a bottleneck where it's compressed and it's trying to reconstruct this, trying to minimize the difference uh, between the input x and the reconstruction x dash. Um, 
what's different now is that the learning, the updating of the weights, um, would in theory require sampling a lot from this latent distribution here, it has the dimensionality 32, which is small in interspace, but that's still too big to sample for all of this learning. Therefore, it would be intractable to do this. Therefore, what is typically done in uh, version of encoders is that they use a Gaussian recognition model, which will denote as QZ given XI, so the index input, that will depend on the mean um, and the variance of this index input. Um, I will now explain this in a bit more detail. So, um, as I said before, we had earlier these simple autoencoders, which have an input, the encoder to a latent representation, and then create an input reconstruction. And then we have a few steps here, uh, but I kind of want to start off with Bayes' theorem because I think that's a nice way to understand this. So if you're familiar with Bayes' theorem, you'll know that you have this equation where you have a posterior here, uh, which is normally what you want to get. You have some evidence uh, based of one variable, you have a prior based of another variable, and then you have the likelihood, which is a conditional probability distribution of the evidence given uh, the prior, and we can get this uh, likelihood from the joint probability. Um, and um, yes, I want to briefly show this step, then explain a bit further uh, what a marginal distribution is, what a conditional distribution is, and I want to go back here. But the basic steps will be that um, you have this encoding part where you create the prior or the recognition model and you sample from it um, to then you sample with respect to the joint probability distribution and then the conditional probability distribution and then you can get the marginal distribution, which is basically, if you go down here, um, the marginal distribution is a bit like the evidence, but just a bit weird because normally in Bayes, we want the posterior uh, given some evidence. But actually, if we go back here, actually what we're doing is we're trying to get this reconstruction. So in a way, we're trying to get the evidence or uh, in this case, we're going to call it a marginal distribution. I'm going to explain in a second what a marginal distribution is. But basically, what you can take away from this step here is that we had Q or P, and we, we, we took Q because that was possible, P wasn't. I will go on that to a second. But we rearranged them, and we want to we get the probability distribution um, of the input, given that we know the posterior, the likelihood, and the prior. But let's first kind of explain what a marginal distribution is. And therefore, um, I'm going to go to my marginal distribution notes, right? So this image is from Wikipedia and this as well, and I think it's going to really make things uh, more understandable because I, I was really confused, like, where does the term marginal even come from? And in terms of etymology, uh, I think this plot is really useful. Okay, so imagine uh, a joint distribution is basically comes from the idea of a joint probability and from school, Probability theory, you will remember that if you have one probability and another probability, let's say this is one variable, this is another, and you multiply them, um, then uh, you, you get a joint probability. And that would happen here if x is one probability, y is another, and a product is this 4 over 32. And then basically what a marginal distribution, uh, distribution is, is kind of taking the sum of these and then they're indexed for each x i x two three. So this would be the marginal distribution value indexed for x one for x two, and then you could do the same for y. So this is the margin, or this is the margin. Therefore, you call it marginal distribution. So let's go through an example just to make that very clear. So as I said earlier, um, you kind of do the summing here. So you would uh, this, this is the product of those two, this is the product of those two, this is the product of those two. If we sum all of them uh, in the margins, uh, people used, I guess, people used to this by hand, instead of using, I don't know, a Python library, then you, you could write it down here in the margin, and you're basically doing this operation here, where you go for the indices of y, uh, j, which is the indices of y here, uh, and then you basically uh, take the, the joint probability summed, da, 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 plus, 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 and you get this thing here. Uh, and if you do that for all of the values, you get a distribution here, which is basically a function 
based of xi that gives you each value. So the distribution is in a way like a function with this export value. Um, and then another way to actually get the conditional distribution, uh, so you get the marginal distribution, because that's what we're interested in, that's the reconstruction of version of the case, is to use a conditional distribution. Sorry for this flicking up. Um, and to explain a conditional distribution, let's go to my conditional distribution node, right here. Uh, and the equation for that it is this. Let's ex uh, ignore this middle part. Uh, it's basically just saying that x is a variable of the set of x and y is uh, the variable of the set of y. But this is the important part, which is basically saying that to get the conditional distribution, we take the joint probability divided by the marginal, uh, the, sorry, the joint distribution divided by the marginal distribution. And I'm going to explain that here with an example again. So now we have our uh, values for x again, but for some reason we know that all values of x are actually when y is 2 or 3. We ignore 5, 4 and 0, 1 because we know those for some reason would be uh, 0. And then what we can do is that we calculate the marginal distribution um, for these values here. So we basically add up these to the margin, that, that is all of those sums, and this is all of those sums, and if we at those two, uh, we get this value, which is the marginal distribution conditioned on y equals 2 uh, and 3. And this is again our equation here. And if we do it all, um, a, con a conditional distribution depends on indices of x, right? So if we do this one step by step by step, feel free to pause and look at this diagram for, so it makes a bit more sense. But uh, we kind of get to this thing here. Um, and I, I want to show this visually again. So here we have our joint distribution with our marginal distribution, and we want to get this marginal distribution. But let's say uh, we don't have a joint distribution, but we have uh, created a condition. So here we have created a condition that y is 2 or 3, and let's say these axes were a bit different, and this to this would be uh, y from 2 to 3. Um, um, then kind of this value these values here, or this thing, which I've highlighted here, will be the conditional distribution. And then what we're basically interested in uh, in getting is the marginal distribution given this conditional distribution and this other uh, marginal distribution, which in our case we'll call prior in Bayesian terms. Okay, so we can then go basically, sorry, we go back to this equation here, where we have our conditional distribution, our equation we just looked at. We rearrange that so that the um, joint probability is on the left side, which is the conditional uh, distribution times the marginal distribution. And then we plug this thing here uh, into this marginal distribution equation, which is basically what we have been doing here, where we sum over the joint probabilities here. It is the discrete case because it's a sum. Um, but we replace, instead of the joint probability, uh, we replace it with the conditional distribution times the marginal distribution of the variable, which is our, in the Bayesian terms, is the prior. Okay? So this is how we can get the marginal distribution. And now, I hope that was uh, a useful crash course in marginal and conditional distribution, because I think now this diagram can make a lot more sense. <clears throat> but um, let's do it step by step, right? So first, we're going to do it for this case, which is not actually the way it's done, because it's intractable, but I just want to kind of talk through the steps. So um, you have step one, you have an encoding part. So this is here in our version autoencoder. You have the data and you encode it. And this is basically going to create this probability distribution Z. So we have Z here, and that's just the distribution of Z is captured by this thing. Then, because we can sample from this distribution, which we also do, people do in the, the paper I'm talking about later, uh, you can get these different samples. And then uh, you got this joint probability distribution, which is the joint probability distribution of the input and the latent space. Um, and to get the... Uh, um, the conditional distribution, uh, you can get that from the joint probability distribution, and we did that earlier, uh, further on the right in my notes. And this equation should be familiar to you now. This is the decoding step, so that's this part here. And this is basically, again, the equation of the marginal distribution, uh, where, note, you have the uh, continuous case with this j, but this j 
and integral is exactly the same thing as the sum and this j here. It's basically saying that we have this indexed input and we're going over y, 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 and we're adding all of the joint probability distributions, but only that we're doing it not for the joint probability, but for the conditional um, probability times the, the sampled uh, um, latent distribution. Uh, so we're doing this, but the problem is that this step is uh, you would describe it as intractable because to do this for for all the inputs, so we're doing it just for x index y1. Here's so one input sample, but if we did it for all of them, it would take far too long. So this doesn't work, and the, the problem for that is that this distribution is kind of too big. So what do we do instead? Uh, here are the steps shown. Uh, step one is similar. We do the encoding. Uh, step two, we sample from the latent distribution, which is this recognition model. I'll talk about that in a second. And then uh, step three uh, is decoding. Okay, let's do that step by step. So earlier, I mentioned that you don't sample from the latent distribution, but you do use this Gaussian recognition model. And that is basically a model that is a conditional distribution of this given that, where uh, it's conditioned on the specific sample. So we have xi here, and we imagine that xi is this first one, x, x1, uh, and it has a mean of a specific value and a variance of a specific value, and those are dependent on what the spectrogram has as features. <coughs> okay, um, then uh, this is basically our encoding step, right? This is shown here. We're creating this, and the reason this can distribution is much narrower then this broader PZ distribution is because we use the mean and the variance to specify it, to align it to this XI, to our index input, or X1. Uh, XI would be the first sample. Okay, um, so step two is then again, as we did here, we are sampling from this. Now that we have conditioned it on XI, we're sampling from a much smaller space. And then here, we again, um, having the joint probability distribution, which gives us the conditional a probability distribution, and we have uh, this conditional here, which is this, uh, multiply it with this term uh, to give us the marginal distribution, and this time it's not intractable because um, this uh, is much smaller. So we can go back to our base theorem equation <coughs> and relook re at this equation, and hopefully now it makes a bit more sense. This likelihood was the conditional distribution of x given z. This prior is the thing we sampled, and this is the Gaussian recognition model that we conditioned on x1, uh, xi, and are dependent on the mean and the variance of xi. So um, basically, the main thing to take away from various auth encoders is that the likelihood uh, can be computed because the joint probability is given. The prior can be sampled, and this uh, Gaussian recognition model posterior can be modeled using the mean and the variance. And the mar evidence or marginal distribution is the thing we want to calculate. That's the reconstruction term, this thing, right? So uh, another way to think about it is that uh, what we did was encoding using this Gaussian recognition model, Q, the posterior. So the posterior is doing the encoding. Um, then we get the, the, the latent thing, and then the likelihood, x given z, is the decoder, which gives you the reconstruction, which is the same as the evidence of marginal distribution. So we're done with variational autoencoders. Now um, let's go actually back to the reason why we're doing this. So, so variational autoencoders, um, they reconstruct input, but that's not very interesting. We, we don't really care about this reconstruction because we already have the better original data. What we're interested in is what the variational autoencoder learns as it compresses the information to, to reconstruct. Uh, and we can, in this bottleneck, um, the information that is known here is known as a latent representation. And as I showed you earlier in the variational autoencoder, you can actually sample from the distribution uh, of here. And when you sample, you get these latent representations. And then using um, UMAP, we can create uh, these nice latent spaces. You can use other dimensionality te uh, reduction techniques because 
uh, we need dimensionality reduction uh, because this has a dimensionality of 32 and we want to make it visible let's say on a 2d plane um, and um, i'm also uh, besides kind of introducing umap and explaining how this dimensional reduction works i'm going to talk a bit about um, umap's true loss function okay so first kind of what is um, a latent space uh, I want to get back to our definitions here. We have samples, one, two, three, and we have features, which are the little pixels here. Um, and as I said, the dimensionality of the uh, latent space is 32, but we want to see it on a two-dimensional plane. So you can do this using principal component analysis, which you might have heard about. And then these two principal components explain most of the uh, linear uh, variance in the latent space. Um, and this latent space is not too interesting, but one thing I wanted to uh, show here is that when we are sampling from these latent representations, uh, we can keep track of where each um, sample is. So for example, this sample here is on this point in the latent space because we have this index. So let's say this is x1, x2, x3. We can say x1 is there, x2 is there, and x3 is here. Um, so it's really important that we can keep track of this position because that kind of uh, can tell us how the original data and analysis we can make about the original data correspond to these uh, latent spaces. Uh, but as I said, this is not very interesting, so we need other techniques such as UMAP. So um, the way I want to introduce UMAP is not through topology. So UMAP uses a lot of topology, and if you read the paper by these authors here, um, you're going to at least I struggled a lot because I didn't know any topology and I think most people don't know either and it's probably pretty cool but it probably just takes a while to get into it. So actually I was um, I want to explain using TSNI which is um, another non-linear dimensionality reduction technique and TSNI stands for T-tailed stochastic neighbor embeddings and was created by these two authors. Uh, so SNI was created by these two authors and TSNI is a variation of that that is T-tailed. Um, yes. So um, let's compare. We, I mentioned principal component analysis earlier, TSNI and UMAP. And um, the, this slide, on the slide, I want to show you uh, something about preserving local structure and preserving global structure, because that is a phrase that is often used when people talk about these methods and what they're good at. Um, and PCA uh, can't do either of that for high dimensional data, which is nonlinear. Um, and to kind of get a sense for that, I have these examples with these cute Egyptian fruit bats. So imagine that each uh, that these fruit bats are doing these isolation calls, uh, where I want you to keep in mind that when they do these isolation calls, it might be important for other bats to hear out who am I listening to. So let's say bat John sounds very distinct from bat um, David. And uh, it makes sense that they sound distinct because when uh, bat David hears bat John, he wants to dis differentiate John from Carolyn. Um, so it's important that they are kind of have distinct calls. And in theory, they are, um, when we plot their, uh, their spectrograms, their vocalizations, um, in a latent dimensionality reduced space, they should be clustered uh, to kind of represent uh, the ID of each uh, call. So each color is an ID. And as you can see in the PCA, there's no clustering, so um, kind of all over the place. And in TSNI is better because as you can see here, um, uh, we have a cluster, which means that this, let's say blue is John, um, and all the blue dots are close to each other, which means the latent space has learned that uh, all of the vocalizations of John sound kind of similar, which is really cool because it basically means that it has learned to cluster a similar um, uh, sounding uh, um, calls. Then um, uh, what is often said about UMAP is that it's not just good at preserving a global uh, this, the local structure, but also the global structure. So let's say um, that these bats are in two colonies, and these two colonies are a bit further away from each other, and there's some genetic variation so that all of the colonies in this green colony sound very similar, and all of the um, bats in the blue colony sound uh, similar to each other. And the idea is that somehow this uh, UMAP uh, should learn that to kind of maintain a global structure of this data, knowing that all of these vocalizations sound similar and all of these should sound similar. So 
uh, unlike Tizni, it would have to know that uh, not to put this cluster here because this cluster should be closer to this cluster. And uh, the exact distances between these points might not necessarily be accurate because of, um, I'm going to go talk about that a bit more, but at least uh, relative to each other, this should be closer to that than to that because them being um, in this, uh, in terms of global structure uh, in this blue colony. Um, okay, let's talk actually about what dimensionality reduction is. Um, and distances is a really important thing here. So we have our um, feature space, which is the spectrograms. And we can imagine that we could treat each of these because at the end of the day, it's pixels. Um, so it's values from zero to one on 128 squared values. And we can imagine we can plot those in a high dimensional space here. Yeah, only three dimensions are shown because we can really visualize more than three dimensions. But you can imagine that you have a 128 square dimensional space where um, each of the points somehow are clustered. Um, and then um, we kind of want to look at the relationship between these points by drawing these distances. So this point blue here has this distance from that, and that's the distance is uh, represented here with a line. And then because we can't imagine this 128 square dimensional space, we want to reduce it to a lower space. Um, but uh, it's important that we maintain the structure that is here and here. So basically, preserving the structure of the graph means preserving the relative uh, distances. So that, for example, if these two points have a, a low distance, are close to each other in the space, uh, in this high dimensional space, then we want something similar here. Or let's say those are those two. They should be also close to each other. So um, to get a better sense for what I had on the previous slide about maintaining relative pairwise distance, I actually have an example from this YouTube video here. Um, so here we have our high dimensional distances uh, and we're interested in this node A, which is kind of close to B and C, but it's very far away to these yellow ones. Uh, and that, that we can basically represent also on this line graph here, where those are very far away and those are close. Um, and um, in UMAP, you have this parameter called number of neighbors, which basically describes, hey, um, I want um, for each neighbor, I want to look at basically for each node, I want to look at the closest neighbors and have them uh, nearby. And I don't really care about the rest. And when you count um, the neighbors, you also count the node itself. So it would be A itself, one, two, three neighbors here with this parameter. Um, and then when you want to uh, move this to the low dimensional distances, as I said earlier, you kind of want to preserve the structure. So the relative distances uh, are maintained. And first you kind of uh, initialize this. This could be randomly initialized or there are other initialization techniques. Um, and then you want to basically optimize. And with this example here, let's say B is very close to A. Uh, therefore, in this low dimensional graph, we want to move B closer to A, which would be uh, one step towards in the direction of preserving the uh, structure of the graph. OK. Um, the whole point of this slide is just to really point out that optimization happens in the low dimensional space because the high dimensional space is <laughs> high dimensional. It would be, take a lot of time to do any optimization there and it really happens uh, here, which is nice because on the next slide, I can show you something. So as I said on the previous slide, the optimizations happens in the low dimensional space. And this is a really nice visualization showing that. So this time we're not, not working with Birdsong data, but this is from the MNIST database, handwritten figures. Um, and the model basically learns to cluster for each number to be in its own local cluster. And I got this nice animation from this uh, YouTube video here, which I can really recommend. And don't see it really too well here, but I guess um, as you see, as these blobs are getting closer to each other, you kind of see some um, attraction. So uh, purple is attracted to each other, but also blue and blue are not being attracted here because they're repelled by the other things. And this, uh, on this attraction and repulsion thing, I wanna get back to later. All right. Um, when doing the optimization, we're going to have one big problem, and that is the curse of dimensionality. And I want to visualize it like this. Um, so first, I'm just going to kind of state this assertion, which is that on average, distances in higher dimensional uh, spaces tend to be larger. 
So I've kind of tried to visually show this here. I am only working with 2 and 3D, so it's not a big difference in dimensionality, but this should extrapolate. So the, the idea is that um, I created these random two vectors, vi and vj, and they are randomly generated with the radius on this circle here, um, and they have the distance dij. Then I did the same for 3D, for a sphere, where I randomly created the two red vectors, vi and vj, uh, anywhere with the radius of um, on, with the radius the same as here, but the positions can be anywhere on the sphere. And as you see, uh, with my <laughs> I guess randomly but still purposely chosen example, the distance here will be shorter than here. Uh, that is just because if you're in high dimensions, you just have kind of more space for the two points to go in different directions too, and the distance will on average be larger. And this plot shows that a bit more systematically. I get that again from this video, and I'm going to use this plot a lot uh, because I think it's quite useful. So here you kind of see um, a distribution where instead of just two randomly generated vectors, uh, you have loads of randomly generated vectors. And because the central limit theorem, if you create loads of random vectors, they will follow uh, a normal distribution. Um, the difference here is though that uh, for here, you, they were randomly generated in 2D, like this green one here, then in 50 dimensions and in 500 dimensions. And as you can see, the average distance for the two-dimensional randomly generated vectors is around 2 or 3. Uh, for the yellow one, it's around 10, and this is maybe 33. And you see that um, the, dimensional, the average distance is very large for these. But we have a problem now. Let's say this was our high dimensional space from let's say our spectrogram we're interested in and this was our 2d uh, low dimensional space where we want to do an embedding and we want to visualize on the space and let's say that distribution meant something right it's not randomly generated vectors but it's something like height this is the low dimensional uh, height and this is the high dimensional height but both distributions still capture something underlying about height and ideally when if we want to as i said quote unquote preserve the structure of the graph we wouldn't want low dimensional distances uh to be uh, uh sorry if you have to uh, to a distance which is quite low in high dimensional space you'd also want that distance to be relatively low in the low dimensional space um which is kind of this scenario here right you wouldn't want those to be relatively similar but the problem is that this uh, this distance is quite high just by the fact that it's in a high dimensional space. So sometimes we have to account for the fact that despite this being high dimensional, it should still be relatively a low distance and that's tricky. Um, and um, actually uh, I'll go more to this now, but um, if you might have heard of TSNI and um, that stands for T-Tail Stochastic Neighbor Embeddings. And actually the name comes from the fact that um, the goal of TSNI was for this and this to be neighbors or neighbor, this to be the neighbor embedding of that. Um, so uh, I think the terminology always helps me to get uh, why the ideas, uh, where the ideas come from. So um, I want to create a toy example where we can play around with uh, some curves and we can, can compare high dimensional distances with uh, low dimensional distances. But first we need to formalize some things. And uh, what happens in the TSNI and UMAP equations is that they convert this dim dimensional distance into a similarity score. So just things that are far away from each other have high distance will have low similarity. Things that have low distance will have high similarity. Um, and you can think of this uh, PIJ as the high dimensional similarity score, which is basically also like a probability of node or point J being a neighbor of point I. So here are the equations uh, for TSNI in UMAP. Um, there are some slight differences, but I, I kind of just want to point out that actually uh, they're quite similar. And you have again this kind of um, distance minimization here. Uh, so the, um, uh, if uh, the distance between point xi and xj um, is very uh, low, then uh, the similarity term will be very high. And this bottom thing 
here um, is a kind of a normalization term, uh, especially considering that it has this variance value, which is also here, uh, as you can see. And I want to talk a bit about this variance value. So um, think, think about it that way that in a high dimensional distance, uh, we could have, let's say, the example where we chose um, sigma, the variance, to be a low value, 0 0.1. And then but basically what we can say is that the similarity will be low for all of the nodes except if they are very close to each other, if the distance is very low. So, so let's say A and B still roughly fit in here, uh, but the rest is there, 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 there. So which means that the similarity score for A and B will have some value, but the rest of them will be super low. So we can basically say D0, uh, which works nice with the neighbor uh, parameter I talked about earlier, um, UMAP. And then let's say A was not here, but here, then uh, we might still want A to have neighbors, despite it being further away. So we, we could maybe choose this variance value of 10, and then over uh, further distances, you will still have some similarity. So this basically can control um, how many neighbors a uh, point is supposed to have. And uh, these days, um, um, however, people don't tend to use these Gaussian affinities that much anymore because it's a bit computationally inefficient and there's a quite, much quicker version which gets kind of the same result it's using k-nearest neighbors, um, which uh, van der Marten came up with in 2014 for Thiesen. And the idea is that um, instead of, since the for a certain variance term anyway, most of the um, similarities will be zero from one node to the other. These all would be zero for this node. Uh, you might as well just say that uh, for this node, we're just interested in the k, let's say 12 nearest neighbors, um, and then you get those. Uh, and that's a lot quicker. So let's talk about the low dimensional distance. And we're going to uh, denote that with the similarity value of qji. Um, which uh, is kind of the same logic, it's the probability that two points will be neighbors, but it's for low dimensional. So just keep this in mind because we'll use this notation later that uh, high dimensional distance is x, low dimensional distance is y, high dimensional similarity is p, low dimensional similarity is q. Um, and here I want to show you that actually the equations are a bit different. In Tisney, um, you have this similarity kernel, which is a bit similar like the similarity score, qij, only that the actual similarity score is the kernel divided by this normalization term z. And in contrast, um, UMAP does not have this normalization term, and that will be very important later. Um, yeah. So for this presentation, I want to create this toy model, which is going to allow us to plot things about the loss function of TCN and UMAP as to give you some better intuition, and we'll have to do a few simplifying steps. So remember that um, I, High dimensional distance x, low dimensional distance is y. Uh, and here um, we're going to do a notation change. The reason I'm doing it is that first we kind of had a notation uh, which really represented that we have different nodes, right? Node i, node j. Um, but now we kind of want to change this around where we want to have a notation that kind of focuses on the distances x and y as arguments, which means that we can. Um, Regardless of where the nodes are in the space, uh, we can just think of uh, defining the loss function in terms of a distance between them, regardless of where they're positioned. And this is this notation here, and this will be very useful for plotting. So um, these two terms uh, come from this uh, blog post, which was really nice. Um, but in actual fact, they come from the equations we just talked about, because this is the um, nominator in for the high dimensional distance p uh, where it's a bit simplifying um, where we're just going to use this term there's not going to be a denominator with variance and sigmas and so it's just uh, this top part it's kind of the you could call it the similarity kernel of the high dimensional dist uh, similarity p but we're going to just going to call it p here and then q uh, 
a, it was kind of the W equation from the previous slide, uh, which was the low dimensional similarity kernel. And um, I, I plotted these here um, to show you why we chose these to be used for high dimensional distance and low dimensional, uh, sorry, high dimensional similarity and low dimensional similarity, because this equation has a heavier tail. So I guess a bit like a more like a t tail distribution, and this being a normal distribution. And um, the intuition for that is that uh, here we want to have this notation where we're going to have x and y, and then we want to later plot values of x and y in a 3D plane. And we want to, for each value of x and each value of uh, y, see what kind of loss we get. And therefore, we want actually, although x and y will be, be widely different, as I said, high dimensional distance tend to be larger, low dimensional distance tend to be smaller. I actually want to plot them for the same value. So let's say axis from 0 to 3 for x and a value, uh, um, values from 0 to 3 for y. You'll see that more in detail. But the reason I'm telling you this now is that uh, we're using these equations to uh, kind of implement this because, as you can see here, for the same value of x and y, let's say uh, x and y equal roughly 2, that uh, uh, similarity uh, q is much uh, larger than the similarity p, right? And what is that? That is these equations are supposed to approximate that on average the high dimensional distances will be uh, the high dimensional similarities will be a lot smaller in high dimensional space and will be a lot larger in the low dimensional space. And these curves kind of approximate that in a um, toy model way. All right. Uh, all right. So as I mentioned earlier, we had our curse of dimensionality problem. Our problem, and the solution is going to be the kolbach leibler divergence. I'm just going to call it KL divergence, and it has this lovely equation here. So we'll do a few simplifying things for our toy model. Instead of assuming many points, we'll just assume two in the high dimensional space. So there will be two points, and they have a single distance. And in the low dimensional space, there will be a single distance y. So we can get rid of this sum term. Then we have this equation here. We're using some log rules for the nominator and denominator. We can kind of rearrange it like this. And we can uh, actually approximate this first term to be roughly zero for both large and small x. So let's first start with small x. If x is uh, very small, the likelihood uh, of two things being close is very uh, large. And therefore, um, in this log term, this will be roughly one. And the log of one is zero, therefore zero times something will be zero. And then for a very large x, um, it is so that this p term, which is um, captured by this equation, um, will quick, quicker go to zero than this log term will go to minus infinity. So we can also assume for large x this to be zero. So we can get rid of this term and just write the KL divergence as this right term here. And now we plug in our assumptions uh, for p of x and q of x, which you saw in the previous slide, which are motivated. And then you kind of get this equation here, which is going to be our key equation for our toy model. Um, so we have our actual K, uh, KL divergence equation and our simplified toy model here. Um, and uh, I kind of now want to explain why the KL divergence is a great uh, loss function. So first, let's imagine the scenario where p, uh, um, so the high dimensional similarity and the dual dimensional p and q is very similar. Um, when they are similar, the, their distances uh, will be also similar, captured by the distance x here, and the dimensional distance here y. So it basically means that at, uh, it's this diagonal. So this is a point where uh, both in both spaces, points are far away. And this is the point where in both spaces, uh, points are close by, which basically means uh, they are neighbors on our earlier di distribution plot we showed. And this is good because it basically means our embedding captures the, makes the right points neighbors, uh, which means that our loss function is low, which means we don't need to do a lot of optimization. Uh, so that's great. Uh, and you can kind of, regardless of a toy model, you can sort of intuitively see this in the original equation, where if these two terms are similar, uh, this will be roughly one and the log of one is zero, so KL is low. Um, so let's imagine, imagine the scenario uh, where uh, the high dimensional distance 
is very low and the low dimensional distance uh, y is very high. So this would be on this plot which we had earlier would be shown here. So again, low dimensional distance very high, uh, high dimensional distance very low. This is a scenario we definitely want to basically punish. The loss should be high and something should change because um, as I said with the curse of dimensionality, it's possible that this value will be low and this value will be high just because it's high dimensional space. But this is the exact opposite of that. The fact that this has a low distance and this has a high distance really means that something has to change. Uh, okay, now we have a scenario where the low dimensional distance will be low. So uh, it's here. Um, and uh, high dimensional distance will be um, either low or high, but because high dimensional distance tend to be high, they're kind of both um, high. And it kind of captures this is a scenario that's okay. We already know that that's this diagonal, that's optimal. Um, but it also, um, when the high dimensional distance is high, so this point and the low dimensional distance is low, it doesn't really punish this so much. So this is, I guess, a limitation of these equations, which we got from Tisney, is that um, uh, when this, uh, uh, it doesn't do anything here. So this is kind of a problem and this kind of gets to the global structure, um, uh, global structure preservation. And I, I want to show that more explicitly in the next slide. So what we had before were, um, were kind of the equations from uh, UMAP using, so, so sorry, Tisney uses the KL divergence. Uh, I could have made that more explicit earlier. But um, UMAP uses something else, which is known as the cross entropy instead of the KL divergence. And um, I want to make the case that this helps um, preserve global structure. So um, here are some simplifying steps, which I got from this article. Feel free to pause them and go through them. I, I won't do it now. But uh, basically, what I, what I want to show is that when uh, x is very small, um, so the high dimensional distance is very small at this area. This is similar to the plot we had earlier, where basically it punishes this scenario here. Um, but this, when x is very large, the high dimensional distances, this is where this equation is different to Tisney, and uh, I think this will help with the global structure preservation. So, um, yeah, uh, here preserves global structure. Uh, I will now show this on th these plots. So um, again, um, this is kind of what I showed earlier, that um, uh, this is our problem from earlier, using these equations, and this is our new problem about the global structure. And let me go to the next plot to show that. So here, um, basically what you kind of see is that this is our global structure problem, because uh, we have uh, high dimensional um, distances in the actual space and we want our low dimensional space to adjust for it. And uh, one uh, way you think about it, about it, if two nodes are very far away from each other uh, and they should be far away from each other in low dimensional space, it's a bit like preserving what we had earlier with the bats that these two classes should be far away from each other. So actually here in this low dimensional space, um, this th this neighbor should be moved from here to here. This would uh, reduce our loss. Um, uh, and um, it's kind of shown on this side here. So again, high dimensional distance is high and the low dimensional distance um, is low at the beginning. This is our starting point, but because it's being optimized in this way, it's becoming higher. And this is the point where we want to get to. And um, I wrote down this is deeper. Uh, using the our toy model and the cross entropy equations, you actually get a steeper gradient here. And one way I was thinking about it that uh, when you do these uh, initialization steps, where you kind of um, first um, wanna uh, with Tisney, you need to do initialization where you roughly wanna preserve the global structure of your high um, uh, high dimensional distances in the low dimensional embedding, and UMAP doesn't need these initialization steps because it does global structure kind of implicitly. And I think this kind of shows that because uh, it makes it so that we first want to uh, 
optimized so that our high dimensional distances are right, which is like roughly getting our global structure right. And then only then we're doing this earlier step, which we're already used to, which is less steep and therefore I think happens maybe only later in the optimization process, which is similar to Tizni where we have our uh, neighbor embeddings problems where this, um, uh, although this is high distance and this is high distance because of the cross of dimensionality, actually this should be relatively lower distance. So we want the point to move from here to here. There should be a purple arrow here and it's kind of doing this distance. So again, to reiterate, um, I think that uh, maybe the cross empty strip in UMAP helps create this global structure preservation because it allows to optimize for these high distances and not just the local ones, which TZN is good at. But we have a problem. So um, the previous slides, that's what I presented on Monday to my class. And I have to kind of now realize that maybe what I was telling them is not necessarily true because the nice article by Nikolai and the UMAP paper where the authors talk about it, they um, motivate the cross entropy with a similar logic to what I was saying. Uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but I think my simplification gets at the, the, the point. Uh, but um, I was talking to Sebastian Damrich, this lovely fella here in Tübingen, and he actually says that uh, UMAP doesn't do global structure preservation that well because of the cross entropy, because uh, it's theoretical reasons for using cross entropy. It's not the reasons why UMAP is effective, but there are other reasons why it's loss function effective. And it's true loss function depends on some other things UMAP kind of does to optimize things. So let's uh, explore that. But to explore that, we have to go back to our definitions. And this time uh, earlier, um, when we had our toy model, we said um, this PX uh, high dimensional similarity was defined by that. Our lowest dimensional similarity was by that. And that's how Nikolai did it in his blog article. But we will change that a little bit by not calling this Q, but we gonna call it uh, W as the similarity kernel, which is also a kernel, but which is not normalized yet. And in a Tizni paper, they do normalization. So basically what they do is that they have this here where this similarity kernel depends is divided by this normalization term Z. So we have a toy model with normalization now implemented. Um, uh, yes, and I said earlier, UMAP doesn't have this normalization term, which I think might be important. So um, this is some maths. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these steps now, but this is basically our starting point from a few slides uh, earlier, um, where we uh, dropped this first term. Um, then we're, this is, you can, you can basically pause and go through these steps. Basically, I'm gonna end up at this term. And notice we have a notation change back to PIJ. Uh, I got a bit confused about this, but because the normalization does not depend on indices because it kind of goes through all of the points. Uh, it can be, be placed uh, before the sum and that's um, uh, important to get at this point. Um, but in a second, we'll go back to PX because that's helpful for our plotting. So we are PX now back for our notation. Um, and uh, earlier I said something about attraction and repulsion and you kind of, kind of see it in the, um, and this is Tizni specific, right? I have these equations from Tizni uh, because there's a normalization which uh, with W and uh, Z, and this is not UMAP, uh, just to make that clear. So we have our toy equation, this time with normalization, and if we insert them into our KL divergence equation, uh, which I've uh, updated using these W terms now, which are the similarity metric, um, then we get um, this. We get, uh, if we plug in these into this first part, uh, so we just consider this term and say, this doesn't exist for a moment, we get this equation here, which is exactly what we had earlier. So this is our typical Tizni punish the situation where the high dimensional distance is low and the low dimensional distance is high. And uh, in the Tizni paper, and in some of Sebastian's work, they all often point out that we can think about these equations as an attraction and a repulsion part, um, where this thing is kind of doing the attraction. And as you can see, it depends on both the high dimensional distance x and y uh, um, here in this way. But 
uh, we also have this repulsion term here, um, which we have now added because of the normalization. If you go to the previous slides, you can go through the steps. You can see that this term is kind of created by having the Z considered. Um, and this repulsion term, uh, if we insert our toy model equations into it, we get this lovely thing. And what's interesting is that, well, first let me kind of describe what is happening here. You have the high dimensional distance x, but this only depends on repulsion. So you could also plot this on a 2D plane in theory because it's invariant to the high dimensional distance. It really just depends on the low dimensional distance. And basically it's a repulsion term where you can imagine that um, if a point uh, is very close to another point, low dimensional distance, they are repelled. Whereas if points are far away, they're not as repelled. So it basically says anything that is close to you, repel it. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what the high dimensional distance is. So how you can think about this whole thing is that you have attraction that depends both on the high dimensional distances, the original space and the low dimensional distances in some uh, interaction way. But repulsion really just depends on the low dimensional distance. And somehow this combination is leading to interesting nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So Sebastian here has a paper called um, on UMAP's true loss function. So basically what they argue in the paper is that the reason UMAP is good at global structural privatization is not due to crest entropy, although they argue that theoretically, but practically happens because they do something called negative sampling. And they use negative sampling uh, for optimization so that a UMAP runs quicker because it, it is quite quick, much quicker than TSNI, for example. And they say that this negative sampling is somehow leading to reduced repulsion or is influencing the attraction repulsion spectrum. And that leads to the global structure. So um, I think negative sampling is a bit confusing to think about. So I made the, these animations. And basically, there are many body uh, um, simulations where you have attraction and repulsion. So um, the two green, uh, so we have two groups, uh, the white dots uh, and the uh, gray dots. And somehow the idea is that through attraction and repulsion, uh, this should, like in the earlier videos, you would wanna all the white points be close to each other and all the gray points are doing this. And these are very slowly getting towards that. Um, so, um, what you can do is that from one group, you sample uh, two uh, edges, E1, uh, e, EI, and EJ. So do those E comes uh, stands for uh, embedding um, node. And basically, you sample the edge between them, edge IJ, which would be this green edge here. And basically, what they um, talk through in the paper is that in UMAP, basically, when AI's position is updated in the optimization, there are three possible things that can happen. So either you sample this uh, edge, uh, IJ, or you sample it opposite, GI, this has kind of the same effect, is that the, because these two nodes are part of the same group, they will be attracted to each other. And you can kind of see it here a bit that they're getting closer to each other, right? Um, the other thing that can influence uh, so this is structure. The other thing that can influence EI is repulsion by um, nodes from the other groups. So we see we have our two groups, uh, whites and grays. And uh, the grays are in the opposite group. So ideally in the optimization process, even all the white ones to be close to each other, the gray ones to be close to each other. Therefore, the gray ones should have a, repel a repelling effect and they kind of should push away this one from the other ones. So these are the two ways EI can be updated. Basically, what negative sampling is, is that uh, when this optimization happens, you kind of iterate, you always sample an edge. Uh, here, the green edge keeps changing, right? Um, and then you have the attraction term. Uh, and for each, um, let's say you do this with k, k nearest neighbors, you sample k attraction terms. And for each of those, uh, you then basically sample what is all the repulsion that's happening? So you kind of look at one attraction pair and repulsion from everything else. What negative sampling basically means is that you don't do repulsion from everything else because here all the um, gray nodes 
are basically repulsing. That's why they're all circled in red. Circled in red, just to reiterate, means they're doing repulsion. And you can kind of see their repulsion strength by the how thick the edges, and they're all doing a bit of repulsion, while it's here only five of them are doing repulsion. So basically what negative sampling means is that whilst the attractive term has kind of stayed the same, in the negative sampling case, you only sample from a few repulsing nodes, and the idea is that a few a bit of repulsion is supposed to approximate all of the repulsion because I guess when they uh, make Innes and the other authors of UMAP and they implemented this, they figured there would some sort of be sort of a uniformity of repulsion, so that it wouldn't be so important to specify it. Um, uh, but um, as um, Sebastian argues in this paper, this actually doing negative sampling doesn't only just speed up um, uh, optimization, but it also changes the repulsion drastically, and therefore actually is maybe although it was not created for that reason, maybe it's the reason UMAP works so well on global structure preservation. Uh, if you want, uh, so I created these animations in Python, it took me far long, too long to make, but uh, you can um, go on the slides in the description or the link there and click on this code here uh, where you, on my GitHub, you can play around with this code and you can basically, when running it, you can change this node repelling now, which is M, um, so you can see how this kind of changes with M, but I, I think you kind of get the idea, right? So um, Sebastian and some of his colleagues in Tübingen um, wrote a couple of papers, actually, not just uh, UMAP's true loss function, where they kind of argue that um, although TSNI is, in theory, sounds very different in terms of its maths, UMAP uses topology, um, that actually are quite similar, and also other uh, techniques like Forest Atlas or Laplacian Eigenmax who are also doing nonlinear dimensional reduction. You can think of them as all on the spectrum, kind of doing a similar thing, but just being on a different spectrum in terms of how much they attract and repulse each other. And they have these papers where this exaggeration factor, or as I discussed the last thing, negative sampling, um, kind of influence where on the spectrum uh, these things are. So this is the, I think, one of the newest papers, the negative sampling one, Damrich, about 2023, the references are all at the end um, in the slides. Uh, and there, if you want to read more about it, you can kind of think about UMAP as just being part of the spectrum, but having a stronger, um, more attraction, uh, and therefore also having a bit more clustering. Um, and having a bit more attraction and clustering uh, can also kind of lead to UMAP artifacts. So I guess you're watching this video because you want to use UMAP and interpret it correctly, right? So you have a better understanding of it. And what UMAP sometimes does is because the contraction term that is maybe leading to the global structure preservation is a bit stronger, you sometimes get um, these contraction artifacts. Um, so let, here's an example from this paper, two examples. Here you have an original data. Kind of what happens is that uh, UMAP sampling so, uh, it, it's kind of contracting it, so the representation is very thin. And this can sometimes be a problem. Uh, seam cells, these are in C. elegans and worms. These are a type of self-renewing cell. So this is from some uh, biological paper they got access to the data from. And when they use PCA, they could plot to show that these seam cells kind of have a two-dimensional variance. So there's so some of them move around this eigenvector and some of them move around this eigenvector. Um, whilst if you look at the UMAP projections on the same data, kind of see that the seam cells are very contracted and it's kind of one-dimensional. So this is prob uh, problematic because it kind of means that although the original data has the structure, this two-dimensional variance, that is lost in UMAP because UMAP is doing a lot of contraction. So you should keep that in mind when interpreting your results. Okay, finally, we have talked a lot about variational encoders. We've talked a lot about UMAP, but now we can talk about mouse vocalizations and bird songs and their latent feature spaces. So you kind of get an idea of what these things are actually uh, implementing. So um, this is all from, uh, by the way, the results from the Goffinet uh, et al. 
paper uh, which I presented in uh, the Birdsong Seminar. So um, what you can see on this is uh, from the virtual auto encoder from the Z uh, um, latent space they they sampled and the first UMAP two UMAP um, dimensions kind of show these different uh, show these gradients and uh, here I kind of want to go back to an earlier slide where I made the point that although you have this latent space which is learning how the different features are arranged you can still know where the different samples are, right? Because for xi, x2, x3, x4, x5, these indices, um, you, you keep uh, track of the indexing, so you know what the position of each of them are. And you can do traditional analyses where you study traditional features of these spectrograms like frequency or duration. Um, and then you can do the analyses for these. And then each of these points is a sample, right? And then you color the sample depending on your the traditional feature and you can visualize that in the latent space which is nice because then you can compare how the latent space captures traditional features and what you can see here as i said it's very continuous so the latent space is learning something about frequency bandwidth or duration in this continuous manner um also uh, in the paper they make this case that these latent features can capture novel information beyond these traditional features. So here's a list of traditional features they looked at. And then these are some previous softwares. Uh, Muppet DeepSqueak is like a um, convolutional neural network to analyze spectrogram. And SAP Sound Analysis Pro is this kind of more traditional software to analyze some of these features for birdsong or uh, other vocalization related data. And you can calculate these traditional features from the spectrograms. And basically what they show in this uh, plot, oh yeah, and so the, these traditional softwares, they create these traditional, calculate these traditional features, whilst the version autoencoder generates these latent features. And the question they kind of ask themselves is, well, are the traditional features explaining more of the variance of the latent features, or is it vice versa? Are the latent features explaining more of the variance of traditional features? And it turns out that the latent features can explain more of the variance. And explaining more of the variance is often science used as an indicator that you have kind of a predictive or representational capacity. And they describe this in the paper as capturing novel information. And another way they can argue for this is that they compare it again to DeepSqueak, this CNN-based um, pipeline and here uh, they show that when you kind of query it whilst the uh, uh, nearest neighbors using k nearest neighbors for um, the deep squeak is quite different to a query it's very similar to the latent features so somehow the latent features are able to learn acoustic similarity okay uh, earlier I showed you this these two spectrograms uh, of this cute little zebra finch. And uh, remember that directed song is directed at the, fe uh, at the female and undirected songs when they are kind of on their own. And in bird song, it kind of makes sense that um, when the zebra finch is directing the songs toward the female, it's really important they get the song right because they want to impress the females and mate. Whilst if they are on their own, they do undirected song, it's okay if they play around more with the song. Maybe they can. Uh, learn to improve their song. In this seminar, we talk a bit about possible regions like Elman and the bird brain that are involved in, in this learning. And um, kind of what these plots are showing is that when you use Sound Analysis Pro, it kind of all looks a bit mixed. But if you use the version autoencoder, you find that there's a lot less variance in the latent space for directed compared to undirected song. And this totally makes sense because the latent space kind of captures how much the, the, the spectrograms or the the syllables, the song is changing, and it's changing a lot less in the directed song, which makes sense given that the zebra finch really wants to stay uh, on, I guess, the song template or the the, the typical song that will impress the female, and they don't want to experiment too much. So this is another slide from the paper, and basically here they make the claim that bird syllables, zebra finch syllables cluster. Um, and mouse ultrasonic vocalizations don't. Um, and they show that with these two latent spaces, where the idea is that um, if things are nearby each other and then there's a distance and then again, uh, although how much this distance is won't necessarily matter, I'll go more into that later, but it's the idea that here the 
syllables are more likely to cluster and bird song is, uh, sorry mouse ultrasonic vocalization is more of a continuous thing and actually quite interesting there's apparently a big previous uh, research literature on whether these mult or usvs cluster or not there was even kind of a heated exchange between the reviewers and the people who submitted this paper you can read more about that in the paper at the end of the uh, uh, on, at the end of the online version but um, basically what they kind of show is that using this uh, latent spaces it seems that the um, bird syllables cluster more and I think this also makes sense when you play this back, uh, the sound again Uh, I mean, this is mainly just me, but for me, it feels like here the syllables are more like tuck, 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 so they kind of feel a bit more discreet. Whereas here, there's kind of a screaming, right? You, I feel like you can also see it a bit in the spectrum, and I guess this is just my impression of it. But for me, it makes sense that this is more clustered than this. Um, and then I think the latent space nicely captures that. So, this is uh, another method they used in the paper. Uh, it's called shotgun variational autoencoders, and the idea is that this shotgun method is uh, supposed to learn a time series data. So, uh, so before, what have we been doing? So far, as I mentioned earlier, we kind of segment the input so that you have single syllables. So you segment here and here, and in the middle there's a syllable, um, right? So now they're changing this. Here they use this shotgun method, and first I, I was very confused why it was called shotgun. Uh, and then uh, using reading the paper again and kind of using uh, ChatGPT actually to interpret something because they use this uh, metaphor from genetics and apparently there the idea is that um, firing a shotgun is a bit like creating a spread of fragments. So in this case, it kind of means that you're randomly um, taking random segments um, so practically you kind of randomize where the onset is and it's a fixed duration, 200 milliseconds. And they call it, as, a, as I'm kind of alluding to, shotgun because uh, it's these random fragments of a random shotgun shot. And the idea is that unlike in this method where the various autocoder really has to learn kind of to reconstruct the input of single syllables, here somehow randomly changing the positions so that these segments are kind of never the same as a previous one. They're all kind of unique because the onsets are randomized. The variational autoencoder kind of learns the underlying time series because it kind of needs to predict what will the next thing be, what will the next thing be, to kind of recreate the reconstruction here, but on a time series way. Um, so I think that's quite interesting and the results of that are even more interesting. So um, what you can see here uh, is kind of a latent space um, and I'm just going to play a little video to make that a bit uh, more illustrative. So um, here you can basically see on the blue dot where uh, at each point in time the um, which which syllables were being played and you could kind of see that the, the point was jumping around here kind of randomly and as i said earlier it's kind of this continuous vocalization space and kind of using these traditional methods they could also um, determine that here there was silence here there were shorter syllables and here there were longer syllables and they kind of concluded that there's no evidence of stereotype sequential structure if we compare that to the zebra finch, uh, it's a bit different. So here I'm going to play the video again. So I think what you could nicely see here is that um, as the, the zebra finch sings their typical routine of introductory notes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which are in that um, fixed order, um, the, the point moves around the latent space in a circular repeated sequence so it keeps doing this loop and sometimes there are these linking nodes where it would kind of go around like that um, sorry it would go around like that and then jump from here to a linking node and then back um, and uh, I think what's really interesting here is um, 
However, UMAP is doing the global structure preservation, whether it is cross entropy or whether it is negative sampling or whatever other reasons we might not understand yet. I think it's really important to use UMAP here because if you were capturing the global structure with this, uh, this latent space um, data, you, you wouldn't be able to capture this. I think it's really interesting. Um, and um, I think it also would be really interesting for future research to consider how this kind of time series latent space uh, data could be connected to other time series data, let's say like neural data. I'm really interested in neuroscience and uh, how uh, bird brains um, work. So uh, I think this is super exciting. Um, here's the same plot from earlier. And uh, earlier we talked about kind of song variability in the context of directed and undirected song. And here I also wanted to show again how the UMAP plot kind of captures that. So the idea is that um, you can kind of see here that the introductory notes, B and the E syllable, they're very variable, right? It changes a lot here, whilst A, C or F, it's a bit less variable. So I think that's a really interesting finding to see how maybe birds, when they play, uh, uh, sing certain syllables, they can play around with B and the trajectory notes more, whereas other things are supposed to be fixed in terms of the, the song evolution. And again, really cool here on the time series data, you can look at this variability over time. So you can really study it. And as I said earlier, if you connect this to the other time series data, like neural data, I think that, that will be really interesting for future research. So the final thing they looked at in a paper were the similarities between tutor and pupil song. So on the this is uh, color coded so that each um, color is a pair of a pupil and a tutor and the pupil is in the, the stronger color and the tutor is in a bit more transparent color. Uh, and if we look uh, use a normal version of thing called a method plus UMAP, uh, you can kind of see how this kind of captures the um, localization space. And I would assume that these kind of syllables are similar to those and those are similar to those. Whilst here, with the shotgun method, it's supposed to kind of capture a time series. So if we look at this brown and more transparent brown trajectory, you can kind of see how they move along this, um, this trajectory. Um, and again, I, I'm going to play this so you get a sense for it. Uh, I hope you could see there very nicely that, um, how, for example, here I felt like listening to it that the both trajectories sound very similar, whereas here on the uh, purple one, they were a bit more different. And I, I think I, I, I could hear that, but it's very nice to kind of get it captured by this uh, shotgun version of autoencoder uh, latent space. Um, so here, uh, they are comparing the tutor and pupil song. And I think it's interesting here kind of to prepare the classical things we can access, spectrograms, versus the latent stuff. So here, inspecting the spectrogram manually, you can kind of see that the tutor has learned this nice little song here. And the pupil hasn't fully learned it yet because um, the A's and B's are a bit different. And especially on the D, you can kind of see that here, it's not as yellow as here, which basically means that uh, people hasn't learned the high frequency power components of the syllable D. And the authors and basically argue that, well, you can also kind of see this in the latent space because D and uh, D of the pupil are a bit, sorry, D of the pupil and D of the tutor are a bit further away in the different orientations. Maybe the orientations capture something about the frequency power component, I'm not, I'm not sure. And then also they argue that the A and B are in different places of the latent space, and maybe that captures the A and B differences here, whilst E's, I think, is nicely matched, and C's uh, also sort of nicely matched. Um, yes. Here they're also looking at similarities, but the this, this time they are focusing on the, the shotgun uh, version of autoencoder UMAP projections. So basically, if we again look at the brown tutor-pupil uh, pair, you can kind of see that the um, 
the pupil and the tutor, they're going at different trajectories here. So there's a difference. And if we look at um, here, the one, two, three represents the time components of going from the C syllable to the D to the end of the D syllable. Can you kind of see that the uh, you can kind of see that the temporary, there's a temporary split between the pupil and tutor, here two and two. And they're also um, quantified as uh, using the similarity metric. Um, and here you can kind of see in the D that it's not so similar, whilst A, B, C on the uh, matching diagonal, uh, it's very, it's more similar. But uh, I, I wanted to mention this because this came up in the seminar when we talked about it. Although the latent space shows that there's a difference and I think this is meaningful. I don't think it's necessarily as meaningful of how far this distance is because basically uh, when interpreting UMAP things and we talk about global structure preservation, there is a, it, it, it makes a difference that this is relatively closer to this than this being relatively closer to that because somehow the global structure preservation is able to maintain those relative distances and the uh, relative attraction versus repulsion capture set. But this is still very high dimensional data in a, what, what was 128 squared times the uh, zero to one um, values. The, there, it could be that there's still a massive, this is much further away than this. And I think the relative distance from here to here, we shouldn't necessarily treat as meaningful. It's just what is, uh, and when you play around with the parameters, you can see that you can change the spacing easily quite a lot. Uh, also by changing the traction repulsion spectrum. But uh, I think, uh, so, so we can't necessarily quantify saying that, oh, this is this much different to that. But I think still visually inspecting it and then going back to original data and getting the latent space um, uh, plots and getting the original data plot, I think you can still learn a lot about Birdsong or other phenomena you're interested in. So um, this is kind of the end of the paper and I think they found lots of interesting things and I think it's especially interesting for the methods and hope to see more of this kind of research in the future. Uh, I just wanted to kind of leave you with some open questions. Um, so the motivation was kind of that we use these unsupervised learning methods and dimensional reduction methods so we kind of get rid of the human bias in let's say choosing hand-picked features. Um, but I think there's still a question of like how we use segmentation algorithms and syllable boundaries. For example, the shotgun approach led to very different results. And in a way that was still a choice made by a human. So I think it's interesting to experiment more with this and get a better sense of how changing the input will influence our results and making that sort of a less of a play around it, less of a thing where we kind of just play around with it and we kind of then create results we expected from our publication, what we wanted to have, but so that we um, make it more strict in um, how we define these things and how we theorize about what these definitions mean. I think it's also interesting, I kind of talked about this, but that the directed versus undirected song goes to previous findings. If you read into the bird song literature, you can um, read about Elman, this region in the brain, and song variability and how learning might be involved in that. And I think that's very interesting to compare these auditory, more in detail, latent findings with the neural data and experiments. And finally, as I said earlier, what if you uh, link this to brain activity? So, so HVC is another region in the bird brain, the um, and um, birds which sing um, in, in their brains, and uh, combining activity there with these latent time series of using the shotgun variation or the method, I think would be really interesting if you could compare those on a, a time step to time step basis. So here are some useful resources. I, I found really useful when learning about these things. So uh, these are, it still takes quite a while to go through these, but these are still kind of introductory so that even if you don't want to read the original TSNI or UMA papers, which would be a lot of work, I think if you're really interested in and you work through these, I think you can learn a lot. And they also mention other resources. And then uh, here are the references of other um, findings and figures I've used. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this.